All righty, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started because it's 2 o'clock. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm going to go ahead and pass the microphone over to Corrine, and she's going to give you a great presentation. All right. Hello. My name is Corrine Colon. I have not used a microphone before, so <laughs> this is my first. Um, I'm here to talk to you today about dietary supplements, a little bit of their regulation and lack thereof, and some kind of common ones that you may be taking or know somebody who's taking. So this presentation is for you and not for me, and so feel free to chime in, ask any questions you like. Oh, sorry. And we will do that. So a little bit about myself. I am a registered dietitian nutritionist. Um, that means I went to a four-year college. I then did a one-year internship program and took an examination. Um, I teach at Cal Poly, Allen Hancock, and Cuesta College, which is how I got in touch with Cassidy, and I do teach nutrition there at all those colleges. Um, I teach general nutrition, clinical nutrition, maternal and child nutrition, nutrition nutrition and aging, um, nutrition customs and cultures, kind of a broad range of nutrition classes. And I've been a dietitian since 2008. Um, during that time, I've also had experience working at some of the local hospitals, Aurora Grande Hospital, Twin Cities Hospital, a little bit in Santa Maria, and I also work at the dialysis centers, which are DeVita locally. So I work with patients with kidney disease. So that's a little bit about me, and like I said, feel free to ask any questions you guys might have. So we're here today to talk about dietary supplements, and how many of you take a dietary supplement? Yeah, I should have said, is there anybody who doesn't? I also take them. Um, dietary supplements are very, very common, and more and more people are taking dietary supplements. About 30% of Americans take four or more dietary supplements, and they estimate that 70% of Americans take at least one dietary supplement. So this is a big industry. And why do we take dietary supplements, or kind of what are they? They can be classified as vitamins or minerals, botanicals or herbal products, which means that they have come from a plant. And they could be the entire plant, such as garlic, or they could be just a part of a plant, maybe some chemical that's been extracted from a plant. They might include amino acids. Some people may take amino acids that can help with cold sores. They may be used for muscle building, strength, et cetera. Enzymes. Enzymes are proteins that help facilitate chemical reactions, and a lot of times we can think of enzymes in aiding in digestion. And then we have this category called other. What might other be? Any guesses? So it could probably be just about anything that you imagine, um, as long as it comes in a tablet, a powdered, a liquid, or a gel form, and it is not intended to be a food. So something is marketed as a dietary supplement, maybe it's a bone broth that's marketed as a dietary supplement versus a food. Maybe it's collagen, uh, maybe it's an essential oil that's marketed as a dietary supplement. I could not find a definition of other. I think it's very broad, so it's kind of up to our interpretation. And as we'll learn with some of these regulations on dietary supplements, there are quite a few things that are up to interpretation, which allows a lot of creative freedom, <laughs> however, also has some risk associated with it. So, <laughs> supplement industry. The supplement industry is a huge money-making industry, and in 2016, it was estimated to be worth 130 billion, with a B, dollars. 
Um, they project by the year 2022 that it will be worth $220 billion. It's actually growing at a faster rate than the pharmaceutical industry. So don't we all wish we had our own vitamin and mineral companies and supplement companies? And it's actually maybe not that hard to establish those because there are kind of few regulations about them. So the supplement industry is really big and people spend a lot of money on supplements. There are inexpensive supplements out there. You can get different supplements for $5, $10, even sometimes the 99 cent store has them. And then there are really expensive supplements out there. I did a quick Google search because that's where you look for all your information, right? And I found some supplements ranging up to $600 per supplement. And so the cost and the amount that people are willing to spend is really just exponential and kind of unlimited. So it's a really, really big industry. But we want to be sure that what we're spending our money on is actually something that's going to help us, that it's not something that's going to hurt us, um, that it's going to be worth that $10 or $5 or $600, and that it's going to be safe and not dangerous for us. And so how can we assure that these things happen? Um, what protections are there for you guys and for me and for anybody going to the supermarket or the drugstore or the 99 cent store or their local pharmacy to get these dietary supplements? Because you don't need a prescription for them. So does anybody have any guesses on what types of regulations there are or how we, how we can tell that we're getting a good product when we go buy a dietary supplement? A seal around like the bottle. Yeah. 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 So so certifications are good. Interestingly, FDA does not certify dietary supplements. That does not mean that manufacturers do not put certified by the FDA on the bottle but they don't certify dietary supplements. But there are a lot of different seals that you can look for, or different kind of endorsements by different industries within the own company um, that definitely seem reassuring. And, and some of them are reassuring. Some of them actually do have truth to them. Anything else? Yes, maybe, maybe you're lucky enough to go to a store where they actually have a nutritionist working who can help guide you on pick which one to buy. That would be fantastic. It's not always the case, but that would be great. Or maybe you go to a nutritionist's office or they have one in your doctor's office and they can say, okay, go out and get this brand or that brand or this dose or that dose. That would be great, yeah. Anything else? Yeah, so it's important to know about the company that makes them and where the ingredients come from. Yeah, maybe how long has the company been established? Do they have a good track record? Are they getting ingredients from abroad? Are they getting local ingredients? Or maybe you want to know if the ingredients are GMO or organic or, you know, pesticide free or gluten free or, you know, produced in clean facilities. I think those are all important things. So you guys are definitely on the right track. And there are some regulations to protect us, but they're not perfect. And so it's good to be conscious consumers and look for all of those things that you guys just mentioned. So what are the regulations? Um, our main piece of legislation right now is established by something called the Dietary Health Supplement and Education Act. And this goes back to 1994. And prior to 1994, we had some supplements classified as food ingredients and we had other supplements classified as drugs. And then each were regulated either as food ingredients or as drugs, pharmaceuticals. But in 1994, they passed this act, and a few of the things that it did is it established how it was going to define a dietary supplement and a dietary ingredient. 
And pretty much what it said is it said everything that we've been using up until it was October 1994, we're going to say that that's okay. So as long as it hasn't had any adverse health outcomes or exposures or accidents with these products that have already been on the market, we're going to say those are okay. Those are dietary supplements. Anything after 1994 that's introduced as a new ingredient, what a company has to do is they give the FDA 75 days notice and they say this is our new ingredient or new supplement and then after that 75 days they could put it on the market. So they don't have to hear back from the FDA at all. They just have to submit a form to the FDA saying this is our product that we're presenting to the market and in 75 days it's going to hit the shelf. The products that they introduce to the market are meant to have evidence that they work and they are meant to be safe and they're meant to be in the amounts that they say they have in them, but the FDA does not check that. I would almost go to say ever unless there's been a complaint. So it's not a regular task of the FDA to establish that what they're putting on the market is safe. So unlike pharmaceutical medications, supplements have no pre-market approval required, which means somebody can sell them, a company, without them having been audited or assessed for safety or checked for contaminants or anything like that. It's up to the company themselves to do those things and to make sure that their supplements are safe and the ingredients that they put in there are what they say they are, they're amounts that you can absorb, they're not going to harm you, they're pure, they're clean, etc but it's not the FDA's job. And so another thing that this law did is, like I said, previous or prior to this law, some dietary supplements were classified as food additives. After this law, dietary supplements were no longer classified as food additives, but food additives are under very scrutinous regulation, and there are lots of laws regarding food additives because they go into our food, right? And we eat them, so let's hope so. But dietary supplements are no longer those, so they, by default, got exempted from all those regulations that food additives have to undergo. And one of them is something called the Delaney Clause, which prohibits the FDA from allowing on the market anything that could cause cancer. That's for food additives, but supplements aren't food additives, so they don't have to follow the Delaney Clause. So that's a potential issue. Um, good things that it did, it required labeling. So labels are good. Labels tell us what's in it, it tells us the amount. That's definitely a good thing. They did stipulate some regulations for allowable claims. So in my previous slide, oops, I'd like to go back. I guess it only goes forward. So in my previous slide, this says Miracle Cure. Can they say that? Technically, they can say that as long as they have the disclaimer, this statement has not been evaluated by the FDA, this product is not intended to cure, cure, treat any disease. So because of our First Amendment freedom of speech rights, supplement manufacturers, there's actually a huge lawsuit on this, they can say just about anything they want as long as there is that disclaimer and that disclaimer would provide reasonable kind of explanation that there's a chance that this statement isn't true. So they did that. Um, they also gave the FDA the right to establish something called um, GMP regulations, which stands for good manufacturing practices. And this is great, although it didn't actually happen in 1994. We'll see that didn't actually happen until 2007. But good manufacturing practices were regulations regarding facilities where supplements are produced to make sure they have sanitization policies, employee hygiene policies, they're free from contaminants, pests, they have temperature control, et cetera. So that was a good thing. 
So looking at the label, um, this is probably a little bit hard to see from where you're sitting, but perhaps in your own handouts you can see it. And some things that might be found on the label, this is a picture from Consumer Reports. So the first thing that's shown on this label, it says proprietary blend. And maybe you guys have seen that on some sort of supplements that you've bought or take or thought about buying, or maybe you've avoided that specifically. And what does proprietary blend mean? Well, proprietary blend is any combination of ingredients that the company wants to put in and call it proprietary. And they don't have to tell you how much of each of those ingredients, they just tell you the total amount of their blend. So you know within their proprietary blend, you're getting the listed ingredients. They are in order of increasing strength or concentration, but you don't know how much. Um, the second thing on this label, and I have to say, I cannot see that far either. Uh, it says, oh, it's the disclaimer. <laughs> And the reason I can't see it is because it's the smallest thing on the label, and it, it literally always is. And so this is the disclaimer from the FDA, and it says these statements have not been approved by the FDA. They usually put it in tiny font. Sometimes it's horizontal, vertical, hidden on the side of the label. They do have to put that. Um, the third thing that's on this label says FDA approved facility. If I saw that, I would be like, that's great. but. FDA's, FDA does not approve facilities. They only sometimes audit facilities. They do not approve them. Even if they were to audit it and find it acceptable, they don't have any sort of seal of approval. So that statement means nothing, although it sounds good. Number four, these are the health claims made by this supplement. So supports metabolism and boosts energy. They could say that, that sounds great. I want a better metabolism and energy. I mean, who wouldn't? <laughs> you know, I, I think this is great. It's thin at all. There's this, you know, kind of nice looking woman here. Maybe I'm going to look like her after I take this supplement. Maybe, who knows? Um, so they can say this as long as they put a tiny, tiny little star, or sometimes it's a cross with two, two lines, and that is referring you back to their disclaimer that that statement wasn't evaluated. And then finally, we have this statement, all natural, which, any guesses on what all natural means? It's meaningless. I have chocolate and you're going to get one afterwards. So it's meaningless. It means nothing. Yeah, it literally means nothing. There is no definition for natural via the FDA, the USDA, the Organic Association, anybody. It means nothing. It sounds great, but it means nothing. So, labels can have some helpful information, but they can also have some information that the majority of the industry thinks is meant to take advantage of the consumer. And the consumers of supplements, they tend to be older in age, they tend to be well-educated, they tend to have more money and they tend to be proactive in their health. So they're trying to do something good for themselves, yet some of these companies are potentially taking advantage of them by putting the claims on their bottles. Um, so you have to be careful. <laughs> so that's the label. So that was mandated, but it's mandated to have a little bit of creativity. As you can see, they can put all sorts of things on it. They have to have it, but they can put what they like. Um, good manufacturing practices. Who has heard of the book The Jungle? A couple of you, yeah. So The Jungle was a book written in 1906, and it exposed some of the horrible conditions in the meatpacking industry during those times. And in the meatpacking industry, they were finding animal parts, people were being injured, people were working long hours, um, there wasn't a lot of sanitation, there was adulteration of some of the meat that had gone past its date etc. Pretty much they just exploited the poor working conditions and unsanitary environments, unsanitary environments of the meatpacking industry. Well, that was 100 years ago. So 100 years from then, approximately 101, we decided, hey, I think we'll regulate the conditions that are needed in a supplement factory. I think it's time now that we enforce these good manufacturing practices and require employee hygiene and clean 
processing and sterilization facilities. I think we'll do that now. I think it's funny it took us 100 years. Like, what were we waiting for all of this time? Supplements could be made in your garage. Supplements could be made in your kitchen. Supplements could be made in your friend's kitchen, in your dorm kitchen, in your roommate's kitchen, wherever. We did not regulate that up until 2007. Thank goodness it's not 2007 anymore, and we're regulating it now, but this is relatively new. While we do regulate the conditions under which supplements are produced, we don't inspect every single manufacturer. And again, it's done in a kind of lottery or random setting. So randomly, certain manufacturers might be inspected that they're actually following their procedures for cleanliness, sanitation, not adulterating their products, et cetera. If they're found to be out of compliance, they can have a warning letter, their products could be pulled, they could even face criminal time, but it's up to them to ensure these conditions. It's not up to the FDA. Um, and I'll say also, when these regulations for supplements were put into effect, there were approximately 2,000 different supplements on the market, so back in 1994. Right now, they estimate there's 100,000 supplements on the market. So in 1994, when they put these regulations into effect, the idea of maybe actually regulating them probably wasn't so daunting. But now, with 200% growth in the number of supplements on the market, the FDA and that branch of the FDA doesn't have the manpower or the funding to be able to inspect every single supplement. So that's part of the problem as well. Okay, so what they don't do, they don't standardize products. For certain things, this might be more of an issue than others. So for vitamins, this isn't really an issue. 100 milligrams of vitamin D is going to be 100 milligrams of vitamin D. However, for those botanical supplements that I said came from plants, plants are different. You don't usually have two plants that grow exactly the same or a crop of plants from San Luis Obispo, California that's the same as a crop of plants in Texas. Plants grow according to their environments, their soil conditions, their pesticides that have been put on them. And because of that, different chemicals in plants can be expressed to different amounts. And so if you're buying a plant-based supplement and it says it has 100 milligrams of, say, ginger in it, you don't know how strong that ginger crop was compared to the last ginger crop that was used to make that supplement. Um, St. John's wort is a good example. There's a specific chemical found in St. John's wort. It's not the entire plant that goes into the supplement, but it's a specific chemical. And the amount of that chemical can vary from crop to crop, which can mean that within different bottles of supplements, maybe you bought one at one store, one at the other from a different manufacturer, they might have used different crops, and it could have different concentrations of those chemicals in them. And so you're not sure if it's 100% the same, um, and so potentially you don't have any negative side effects when you're taking a supplement for even years and then you get a bottle that came from a really potent strain or potent crop and all of a sudden maybe you do have some side effects. So that's not standardized where it is standardized in pharmaceuticals. Another thing kind of related to this is serving size. They don't standardize the serving size of supplements. And so for vitamins and minerals, there's something called the upper level or the tolerable upper level. And anything above that amount is associated with adverse risks. This is a value established by um, our government. And um, yeah, so, so you would think that a supplement company wouldn't be allowed to go over that value. But they are. They can put whatever they want in it. They can exceed that upper level. Um, and I have an example of it 
right here. So these are two vitamin Ds. Um, they're both the same company. I think I bought them both at Costco, but they sell them everywhere. Nature's made. This is actually a very good company, and it has a seal that's actually a very good seal, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, this larger bottle has 2,000 units, so you would take one a day. This smaller bottle has 5,000 units. The upper li limit for vitamin D is 4,000 units daily. So if I bought this off the, count, off the counter, this is higher than the tolerable upper limit, and there's no warning whatsoever on this bottle to say that at all. And that's 100% allowed, and it's actually been certified by a third-party company. So there's no regulation on the serving size, whether or not it's exceeding these levels or not. So I could pass these around if you guys want to check them out. Um, other things. I said that they do not approve them for safety, so it's up to the manufacturer themselves to prove that their supplements are safe. If there's a complaint, so say somebody gets sick or somebody has an allergic reaction, that person is supposed to contact the company and say, I got sick. I took your vitamin D 5,000 units for a year. Now I have bone disease. I got sick. It's up to the company to report that to the FDA. So you're hoping that you're trusting your company to call up the FDA and say, hey, FDA, somebody got really sick off one of our supplements. That's a pretty big honor system, right? It's up to the company to call the FDA, tell them that there was an issue, and then it's up to the FDA to prove that there was an issue. So the burden of proof lies with the FDA, not the company. The company does not have to prove their supplement is safe. The FDA has to prove that their supplement is not safe before they can pull it from the market. So that gives manufacturers a lot of freedom or a long leash per se, and it makes you as consumers really want to trust which manufacturer you're buying your supplements from to do those kinds of ethical things, you know, proving that their products are safe and reporting if anything adverse happens. Other things, I mentioned already that they don't approve claims, so there was a First Amendment lawsuit saying that the FDA could not reject a claim as long as there was that disclaimer and somebody would be able to make a reasonable judgment on the truth of that claim based on the fact that there was a disclaimer. So like I said, they can say just about anything they want and they don't analyze the content. So if I'm taking this melatonin that's five milligrams, there's nobody who said that this really is five milligrams, except for Nature's Made, who hopefully I trust and really put five milligrams in there. But the FDA is not checking that. Um, so they're helpful, but they could be a lot better. What can you guys do? So obviously the FDA is not doing everything that as consumers we would like them to do. So you have to be kind of smart and what I like to call private investigators for yourself. Obviously when you take any supplement or medication or herbal product or new remedy, you should always consult your doctor and your dietitian. <laughs> so that's my first disclaimer. You should always tell your doctor. Um, the next thing you can do is look for free information. And I'm not sure if you can click on that link right there. Um, it, it might mess things up. Okay, so I put a tiny link because I didn't want you to have to see the whole URL, but there's all sorts of free information out there. Um, and after the talk, I can tell you more about it. But one of the really good ones is National Institute of Health. And they have a dietary supplement fact sheet page where you can get free information about all sorts of dietary supplements and you can look them up alphabetically and it is funded by the National Institutes of Health so it's based on science-based research. Um, the only thing I would say about that particular page is for some supplements, their information hasn't been updated as frequently as I personally would like. So sometimes you'll look up a supplement and you'll read it all and you'll get to the bottom and you'll find 
oh, this hasn't been updated since 2014, um, which doesn't seem like that long ago, but in the field of nutrition, things are changing minute by minute, and I don't expect them to update minute by minute, but I like maybe within the last year or two at least. So you just have to be cautious if you find a page that hasn't been updated very frequently. Um, other things you can look for are third-party certifications. So those bottles that I passed around, they were certified by the USP, which, which is found in the middle there. And the USP stands for US Pharmacopeia. And it, like these other two companies, Consumer Lab and NSF, are all third-party companies, meaning they're independent companies. They're privately owned, they're not government run. And what these companies do is a supplement company will pay them to audit their supplement. And as part of their audit, they will look at the facility, they'll make sure it's clean, sanitized, they'll look to see that there are no contaminants in that product. So they look for things like heavy metals, lead, cadmium, mercury. They also look at what's called filth, which is insect parts. And they make sure that the number of insect parts in your supplement do not exceed what's allowed. They also, which I think is equally important, they make sure that what the supplement says it has is actually what it has. So they do chemical analysis of each supplement. So if it says it has 5,000 international units vitamin D, they'll check does it really? And they won't approve it if it doesn't. If it exceeds it by a certain percent, they'll usually approve it as long as there's no risk for exceeding it. But if it's under, they won't approve it. The other thing that they'll look at is, is this supplement in a form that your body can actually use? Because that's kind of the point, right? <laughs> can we even use these things that we're buying and putting in our bodies? Some supplements you can't. Some supplements will pass through your digestive tract undigested. And when you don't digest things, that usually ends up with some negative side effects. So we want to be able to digest these supplements. So they'll make sure that the supplement can actually dissolve in your body, release its contents, and your body will be able to absorb them. Um, so when you're buying a supplement, these are three good seals that you can look for. And... I have seen the USP also been um, represented as like a red triangle, so sometimes the emblems are slightly different. I've seen the NSF have a white background and blue letters before, um, and the Consumer Lab one is usually just as it appears. A little bit about the other companies, NSF is the National Sanitation Federation and they're also a third party company that will audit these supplements. And then Consumer Lab is two. Consumer Lab, USP, and NF NSF all provide free websites where you can search and see which supplements and which brands have been approved and not. Some of them have the supplements listed by manufacturer, and some of them have the supplements listed by type of supplement, like vitamin D or CoQ10 or something like that. So you can search these sites for free to see which supplements are approved or not, maybe before you head out to the store to go buy them. Um, another cool thing that Consumer Lab does is it actually does full extensive scientific literature results on all of these supplements explaining what the best form is, when to take it, how much to take, and which diseases it might be involved in treating. However, in order to get those full extensive reports, you need a membership. And the membership is like $69 for two years, which I have known about these companies for a long time. I never got a membership because I'm like, what are they going to tell me that I don't know? And literally before this presentation, I got the membership. <laughs> and I'm like, why didn't I get this before? But they have really great information. And the way that I looked at it now um, is that it's $35 a year, and maybe that's $35 that I'm not spending on a supplement that's not going to work. So... It's interesting if you're interested in that kind of thing. Um, but these are some of the companies you can look for for certifications on what might work. I have one bottle with the NSF label. I can pass that around as well. And I don't have any with the Consumer Lab, um, but this one has NSF. So you can see what it looks like. 
Okay. So, now that we've talked a little bit about regulations, I want to go into um, some supplements that you might be taking. And for interest of time, I might skip around a little bit. I think I'm going to go to uh, K2 and potentially curcumin, and then I can come back. Oh, this might be a little bit. But I can go back um, to some of the others. Can you skip to K2 by chance? OK. Oh, here we go, K2. OK, so who has heard of vitamin K? A couple. Who's heard of vitamin K2? One. K2, yeah. So vitamin K, there's actually multiple forms of vitamin K. And there is vitamin K1, which most people have heard of. And then there's vitamin K2, which most people have not heard of. And vitamin K2 plays a slightly different role than vitamin K1. And the role of vitamin K1, what most people know it to do, does anybody know what it does? Or where they might have heard about it? Does anybody take warfarin or coumadin or know anybody who ever has? So vitamin K, actually both forms, but vitamin K1 plays a role in blood clotting. And that's one of the main features of vitamin K1. Vitamin K2, while it can also be involved in blood clotting, plays a big role in bone health. And vitamin K2 can do this by helping calcium get into your bones. And by calcium going into your bones, the calcium moves out of your arteries. Why would we not want calcium in our arteries? Calcification. Calcium is hard. Calcium is like little tiny bone crystals. And we want our calcium to be in our bone so that our bones are hard. We don't want our calcium to be in our arteries because otherwise our arteries are hard and we can have something called calcification develop. Well, vitamin K2 plays a role in getting that calcium to move from the arteries into the bones. And so in that way, it can help your body with vitamin D and calcium. We have heard that vitamin D and calcium are important for the bones. Well, vitamin K2 is also important for the bones. Vitamin K2, most people don't get enough of it because of where it's found. And so one of the highest sources of vitamin K2 is a fermented soybean product called natto. And I actually just bought some today. I tried to buy some yesterday, but I went to Whole Foods, Lassen's, and Trader Joe's, and they didn't have it. And then my boyfriend said, why don't you go to the Asian market? I'm like, why didn't I think of that? So I went to the Asian market. They had it, of course, so I bought some today. Um, I even tried it for lunch. I can't say that it's delicious, which is what I had read about it but it's the highest source of vitamin K2. And if you would like, after this presentation, you can try some. Um, next, the highest source of vitamin K2 is goose liver, which, yeah, from your faces, I can see you're all gonna go home and have some. But sometimes it's consumed and often in the form of a pate, so that's one of the highest sources. Um, maybe something that you'll be happier about, cheese. Who likes cheese? Yeah, most people like cheese. So it's also found in cheese. However, the amount found in cheese is about one-tenth the amount found in the fermented soybean product and about one-third the amount found in the goose liver. But don't fret. It's found in cheese, and it's found in both hard cheeses and soft cheeses. So it's found in blue cheese, brie cheese, camembert cheese, parmesan cheese, um, regano cheese, all sorts of cheeses. 
And the reason that it's found in these products is because it's a product of bacterial fermentation. And so that's why we find it in the fermented soy. It does occur naturally in the liver because that's where we store a lot of our vitamins. And then it occurs in cheese. And so some interesting studies that they've done, um, they did a study called the Rotterdam study, and what they found is that people who consumed the highest levels of dietary K2 had, it was about a 57% lower risk of heart disease, and it was like a 23% lower risk of all-cause mortality. And for me personally, the good news about this study was where these people were getting their K2 was from cheese. So who would have thought that eating cheese might actually reduce your risk of heart disease? None of you guys. <laughs> and some people would disagree completely. But that's what they found, and they've also done huge studies, meta-analyses all over the world, and they've found the same results. I get um, its Journal of Clinical Endocrinology, and it was about a year ago, but the highlight in this journal of clinical endocrinology was eat more cheese. And I was like, what? How could this be? And all of these large population-based studies found that countries where they consumed cheese had lower rates of heart disease. So maybe it's the vitamin K2. It's possible. If you do not want to eat cheese because maybe you don't like it or you're lactose intolerant or your doctor told you not to because it's high in saturated fat, cholesterol, which is a whole nother can of worms, um, you could look into taking a supplement if you dare after the previous conversation on supplements, but there are supplements out there as well. Or you could try the fermented soybeans, which are a good source of fiber, good for your microbiome, or maybe the goose pate. Um, this is just a picture of some of the functions of vitamin K2. So this is looking at an artery, and normally we want our arteries to be clear and free so that blood can flow. We like them to be very elastic and pliable and kind of able to stretch as our blood pressure increases and decreases. In calcification, calcium deposits within our artery walls, and this can lead to inflammation. It can lead to narrowing of the arteries. And it can happen anywhere in the body, and the place that we're most concerned about this is at a large, in our large vessels of our heart. And so that's kind of the relationship with vitamin K. Some other things that I would say about vitamin K, um, vitamin K2 specifically, in Japan they use vitamin K2 as both a treatment and prevention for osteoporosis because of observational results from Japanese populations who eat a lot more of this fermented soybean product than we do. They found, hey, this is really working. So they actually use it as a treatment for um, bone disease in Japan. They have looked at its relationship in cancer, and it may have a relationship with cancer. And it may also have some anticoagulant properties. So if you are taking a blood thinner medication, you would definitely want to discuss with your doctor before adding this to your diet. If you're not taking a blood thinner medication, sometimes having slightly thinner blood is better. And we do eat things that can help thin our blood. So this might be beneficial. Yeah. It is, but the type of bacteria, and I don't know what it's called that does tofu, um, are different than the type of bacteria that's fermented this. And this bacteria in here is called Bacillus natto. Yeah, and, and the texture of this is, it's slimy, where tofu is not, thankfully. Um, so they're very different. But yeah, tofu another can of worms, and soy in general, but I, I, I personally think soy products are healthy, but there's a lot of research kind of both ways with phytoestrogens in soy and different components of soy, but they don't have that particular bacteria. I was thinking miso too would be good when I was at the Asian store today. I'm looking at all the shelves like, oh, miso tastes so much better. Maybe that has some in it, but it doesn't. So, okay. So, how about turmeric? Has anybody heard about turmeric? What have you guys heard? 
Cool. You guys use it in your food. Did somebody tell you to, or you always like the flavor? Mm -hmm. So you're using the spice, then you found the supplement. Yeah, how about you? Same thing. Yeah, anybody else? So turmeric is kind of, I could say, like a hot topic currently. Um, and turmeric is a plant. It's a root plant. And so this, again, would be an example of a botanical dietary supplement. And it could be used as a food or a spice, or if it's marketed that way in a pill or a gel or a powder or a liquid not to be used as food, it could be a dietary supplement. So sometimes there's overlapping between the categories. Um, turmeric is another example where since it's a plant, a turmeric plant that I may have grown in my backyard, if that would even be possible, might be different than a turmeric plant that grew in India or Mexico or any other place, you know. So because of that, they could have different chemical properties. And the chemical that we're looking at with turmeric is something called curcumin. Has anybody heard of curcumin? And so that is a chemical found in turmeric. It's actually, there are multiple what they call curcuminoids, so chemicals that have this curcumin-like property, but we look at one primarily and we call it curcumin, and that's what's found in the dietary supplements. So turmeric has been around for thousands of years. It's used in ancient Ayurvedic medicine. It's been used as a cosmetic. It's been used as a spice, a seasoning. It's been used as a coloring, um, a skincare product, all sorts of different things. Sometimes it's put in teas. Sometimes it's used in curries. Um, but it's been around a really, really, really long time. In the United States, we use it in spices. We use it in mustard. We use it in, it's actually found in cheese and a little bit of butter sometimes. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, it will stain everything. Oh yeah, it will stain everything. Caution with turmeric. It will everything will be yellow orange. So this is some turmeric powder. It is this deep yellow orange cover color. Um, and my boyfriend was making some sort of a beverage with this, and it was fermenting. And when you ferment, something gas is produced. Well, he had the lid on tight. It was a cork lid. The cork exploded and the turmeric went everywhere within our pantry and cabinet, and we have white cabinets that are now like permanently yellowish. <laughs> but it, it will stain your hands, your kitchen counter, your hair, um, and some people like that color, and so some people actually put it on their skin to have it change this kind of orangish color. To me, it would kind of look like a bad spray tan, but that's just my opinion. But, but it is used in cosmetics frequently, um, but it will stain everything. So wear your apron if you're cooking with it. Um, but it does come in that powder, and it has been touted as having so many different health benefits. So ulcerative colitis, cancer, anti-inflammatory, arthritis, depression, um, all sorts of different things. But what does the science actually say? So there are a couple things that the science says um, with regards to depression. They have found it to be as potent as some antidepressant meds. However, you have to take certain supplements of it for three to four months before it will kick in. And that's not too surprising because some antidepressant meds have the same kind of time frame before they begin to work. As far as inflammation goes, it is a potent anti-inflammatory molecule, and that means it can reduce inflammation in all of the cells. And one of the things that they feel is contributing to chronic disease more than others is inflammation. 
And we think of inflammation as maybe heat or temperature or we get a cut or something and something swells up and it's hot to the touch. But it's possible to have whole body inflammation that you don't necessarily feel on an everyday basis or inflammation within your arteries or within your joints um, or your muscles. And so they do think and evidence has shown that turmeric has some really strong anti-inflammatory properties because they can do tests to assess markers of inflammation and they find when they give people turmeric those markers of inflammation come down. Pain. To me this is a very good one and a strong one. This is one of the stronger pieces of evidence with turmeric. Um, specifically studies on arthritis, both osteo and rheumatoid arthritis. They've found turmeric supplements to be equivalent to non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications. So things like Advil or Motrin or Aleve. But turmeric doesn't have the negative side effects that those do. And so for pain, it has been beneficial. Um, as an antioxidant, it can help scavenge free radicals, which are like elements that have unpaired electrons. And so it can help reduce oxidative damage. And oxidative damage can contribute to artery inflammation, heart attacks, strokes, cell breakdown, etc. Cancer. So they have done both human and animal studies. Um, in animal studies of breast cancer, they have found that the animals taking the turmeric had longevity, 50% longer longevity than the animals not taking the turmeric. That's been confirmed not with a longevity component, but a reduction in metastases in humans. So it's also been looked at for lung cancer and prostate cancer and colon cancer. The evidence isn't as strong yet, but they're looking at it for that. Metabolic syndrome. So metabolic syndrome is a clustering of diseases, and it could include high blood glucose. It could include high triglycerides or cholesterol. It might include abdominal obesity. It might include high blood pressure. And turmeric has been found to reduce every single component of metabolic syndrome individually. So it increases insulin sensitivity. It can mildly lower blood pressure. It can mildly lower cholesterol. It can mildly lower triglycerides. Um, other issues, heart disease. So this is a National Institutes of Health supported recommendation from about curcumin and um, in people who have had a previous heart bypass, taking a curcumin supplement prevents further surgeries and it speeds recovery from surgery if they have to have a heart bypass surgery. And if they are having radiation, so say somebody's undergoing radiation treatment for cancer and they're taking curcumin simultaneously, it will reduce the skin inflammation that can be caused as a side effect of radiation. Um, and that was specifically for breast cancer. So there have been lots and lots of studies done and they're continuing to do more studies. Sometimes you have mixed evidence and the reason for the mixed evidence is because turmeric is a little bit, it's a little bit stubborn. And so when you cook with turmeric, you don't actually absorb that much of it. Turmeric is a product that passes very, very quickly through your body. And when it passes very, very quickly through your body, you're not able to absorb it and it's not able to have those roles. There are certain things you can do to enhance the way you absorb and process and metabolize turmeric. And as far as culinary wise, two of those things are pepper and fat. So pepper, if you use pepper with turmeric, it enhances your ability to absorb it, I think like 20%. And then if you eat turmeric with a fatty food, so maybe an oil or a butter or a ghee or cheese or an animal product that has fat, um, that's going to enhance your absorption too. And it enhances absorption so much that they say if you're taking a turmeric supplement and you're not eating it with food or you're not taking it with pepper, you're wasting your money because you're not going to be absorbing it. 
unless that particular supplement is has been modified to become more bioavailable to you. So there are now some supplements on the market that have been modified so that you don't necessarily have to take them with pepper or have to take them with food. And some of these supplements actually have the active ingredient of pepper mixed in them. And some of them have been processed so that they're much, much smaller and your body can absorb them. Um, so there's different types of supplements on the market that your body can absorb better. But if you're taking just a regular turmeric supplement, um, you won't be absorbing very much of it unless you take it with pepper or a fatty food. So it's a little bit about turmeric. And I think we maybe have time for CoQ10. Five minutes. Okay. So we'll do a little bit on CoQ10, and then after this hour is over, I can stay for you all personally, but yeah, the, the recording will stop. So CoQ10, who's heard of CoQ10? Yeah, so CoQ10 is something that our bodies produce naturally. It's not considered something that we necessarily need to supplement unless we've been diagnosed with a deficiency, which is actually really, really, really rare that somebody would have a deficiency in CoQ10. Um, that being said, CoQ10 levels do decline with age. And so sometimes as people get older, they feel that they may need higher doses of CoQ10 because they don't have as much as they used to. And certain medications can interfere with CoQ10 as well. Um, kind of like turmeric, CoQ10 can function as an antioxidant. And so it can protect our body from oxidative damage. Also, kind of like turmeric, CoQ10 can help the heart. So for people with heart disease, they found that taking a CoQ10 supplement could increase something called ejection fraction. It's pretty much how well the heart is pumping by about 4%, which doesn't seem like a lot, but it's much better than nothing. And so when people's hearts are pumping efficiently, their blood is circulating, they're gonna feel better, they're gonna have more energy, they're not gonna be as out of breath. Other things that it can do. Um, this is a super, super complicated diagram right here, but it's essential to energy metabolism. And I put that diagram not because I wanted you to really understand it, but just to, just to emphasize the fact that it's needed every single time we make energy. And so sometimes people might feel that they have low energy if they had low CoQ10. And this is one thing that I've noticed doctor's offices, advertising, come get your CoQ10 shot, it's energy boosting, or different supplements advertising this. Well, unless you have a true deficiency, your body has plenty of CoQ10, and it won't necessarily boost your energy. However, it's still good for your heart. Other things that it can have a role in is cancer and cell growth, and so that's kind of what is emphasized right here. Okay, so what does the science say about if you might benefit from a CoQ10 supplement? So during chemotherapy, your heart can have some adverse risks. And so you actually have some heart toxicity that can happen during chemotherapy. If people take a CoQ10 supplement, they have lower risk of cardiac toxicity during chemotherapy but not radiation. Radiation relies on the fact that it's causing oxidative stress to your cancer cells, so you don't want to take an antioxidant that's going to counteract that. So it's important to chemotherapy. Statins. Statins are used to lower cholesterol. Many people experience side effects from statins, and so CoQ10 was advertised as a way to reduce those side effects, specifically muscle pain. Most studies have found that to be inconclusive. Um, however, some groups of people have felt some relief from statin muscle pain, and statins do reduce your CoQ10 levels. So the thought was, let's replace them, and this might alleviate some of the side effects of statins. Immune system, CoQ10 can help with the immune system. So in patients who are immunocompromised, maybe they have ammonia, HIV, AIDS, any sort of disease that's affecting their immune system, CoQ10 is vital to that. 
in addition to other treatments. So I said it can help with chemotherapy, it can help with pain medications, it can help with anti-cancer medications. And then for heart disease and heart surgery, it's been found to be beneficial. Um, it's been associated with increased heart function, quicker recovery after surgery, and better blood pressure, as well as better energy. So that might be helpful for specifically heart patients, but not necessarily the general public. If you have migraine headaches, there's some evidence that it helps with that. And then the risks are very few. Only 1% of the population experiences any risks related to CoQ10. Um, and some of those are like nausea, vomiting, insomnia, which are not great, but only a small percent of the population experiences them. So I think that's all I have for the two minute or two hours. And uh, Cassidy will stop the recording, but I have other things that I can stay and talk to you guys about and answer questions. Oh, hello, other guests. Do you have any questions? Oh, I have, I have a question here. So yeah. Yeah, so I, I have not personally researched collagen yet, so I wouldn't be able to give you like an accurate answer on that. Um, so that's, that's the truth is I don't know. I haven't researched that yet, but I could after this talk really quickly, I could look some stuff up, but yeah, I'm not sure on collagen. It's hard because the information changes so rapidly that even to research like the few topics that I do, it can take hours to really get to the bottom of it. And I have access to all the professional journals and peer reviewed studies like through my universities. And even then it can be okay. so hard to sort through. Oh, okay, a question. I don't know. I think that somebody needs a microphone. Well, uh, I pressed select, but that didn't do anything. Hello? Maybe say it one more time. We couldn't quite hear you. Uh, we, we still can't hear you on our side. Do you guys have a microphone? Maybe can you email Cassidy the question or sign language I don't speak if somebody wants to translate for me. Anybody else have questions here while we wait? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so some supplements do have levels at which toxicities could be a risk and some do not. Um, and it also depends on each person, so it might depend on if you're taking certain medications or maybe you have any other like underlying diseases like kidney or liver disease or heart disease, you might be more at risk. Um, as far as CO10 goes, so far there's not a lot of risk of taking too much of that. As far as curcumin goes, there is some risk at very high levels. Some studies have shown it contributes to liver disease. Some studies have shown it actually helps liver disease. Um, but, yeah, vitamin B12, there's no upper limit for, so in theory you could take as much of that as you want. Vitamin D, there is this higher dose for. Um, vitamin K2, there is not an upper limit for, so in theory you couldn't take too much of it. Um, we haven't seen it, any bad problems in the population yet. So it really depends on each supplement, yeah. So yeah, so like water soluble versus fat soluble. 
Yeah, so um, the water-soluble vitamins, generally we flush them out via our urinary tract. Um, but some of them, like B12, we can actually store a little bit. Or the fat-soluble ones are more difficult to excrete because they're stored in our fat cells. So for fat-soluble vitamins, there is a higher risk of toxicity as well as things that are stored within the fat cells. There's different chemicals that are stored within the fat cells. And so that is definitely true with regards to most of them. I think, yeah. Okay, she's going to try to help them. Yeah. Over at the Polo Club, do you guys have a microphone in your hands? Do you have a microphone in your hands? Okay, is there a yellow button? Is there a yellow button on your microphone if you're looking at it? It might be on mute. There. Okay, try it now. Hello? Try it now. Can you hear? <laughs> yes, you're yeah. good. Don't have a yellow button on our microphone. No, there's no yellow button. No, no, you guys are good. You guys are good. Can you hear me? Yes, now we can hear you. Oh, okay. So my question was, you had a, a slide on B12, and it says, don't take B12. Did it say that? Well, it said something like that, so it was kind of an alarmist screen. Yeah, I don't think that it said exactly that. Um, it said maybe you don't want to be without it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I had B12 on there because um, B12 is important. We absolutely need B12. It's part of every sort of reaction in our body. And with age, sometimes people have lower levels of B12 for a couple different reasons. One is that we require adequate amounts of stomach acid to absorb B12, and sometimes stomach acid production is decreased naturally with age, as well as people may be taking antacid supplements like Tums or Rolaids or Prevacid for heartburn. Another reason people can have low B12 with age is due to something called intrinsic factor, which is needed for B12 to be absorbed across the intestines. And it's really common with age that people have lower levels of intrinsic factor. And um, also there's many medications that interact with B12. For example, metformin, which is a drug used for diabetes. 30% of people who take metformin for two years or longer can develop B12 deficiencies. And while B12 is a water-soluble vitamin, it's one that we can actually store in the body for a decent amount of time. Um, adults can store enough for two to 10 years, depending. And so deficiencies develop very slowly, but deficiencies can sometimes look like other disease. So other diseases. So for example, some of the symptoms of deficiency might include like tingling or tiredness or fatigue or memory problems or cognition problems. Um, that maybe you think are normal in the last 10 years, but they shouldn't be normal. And so um, B12 can play an important role in reversing and preventing some of those symptoms. So th I think I was saying that it's important. Now I've got some questions on my side, but uh, yeah? I have a okay, Repeat. here, question here at Tw Twin Mills Club in North Carolina. Okay. Hi, you mentioned uh, one manufacturer, Nature Made. Are there other manufacturers that you would recommend or any manufacturers you would recommend that we absolutely avoid? So I, I don't know them off the top of my head. Um, the particular brand that's showing right now of CoQ10, that was one that's certified. Um, but I would recommend going to the individual websites like the USP, the NSF, or Consumer Lab, and you can look up any supplement you want by name or manufacturer. I know most of the Nature Lab products are certified, or Nature's Made. I know most of the Kirkland Signature ones are certified. Um, I know most of the GNC ones are certified. Some of GNC, the General Nutrition Center, their own brand. Um, some of the ones from Walmart are certified. I was surprised to know. There's one called Doctor's Best. That brand of supplements, most of those tend to be certified. Um, but there's all sorts of different brands out there that are certified. I couldn't say like one to avoid specifically, but 
just kind of looking for those labels or if you forget what those labels are when you go into the vitamin store or the supermarket, asking somebody to guide you to find some of those labels. Thank you. You're welcome. Do you guys have any more questions? Are, are there looks like there's one in the front. And so maybe somebody could give her the microphone in the blue. Yeah, the microphone to work. Just talk, we can hear you. Okay. In the when you describe the ingredient blend, you said that they go in ascending order, which is the opposite of most ingredient lists on products, they go in descending order. The first one is usually the most prevalent. But you said oh, it's I probably the opposite. misspoke if that's what I said. Oh, okay. Yeah, I probably misspoke if that's what I said. I meant to say that the ingredient listed first had the highest concentration, and then the one listed last had the lowest okay. concentration. I forgot about the Trader Joe's. The white. <laughs> What? Trader Joe's. Oh, do you know anything about the B12 they sell at Trader Joe's? Two of us, of uh, the four of us take it, and we're thinking, I wonder if you've heard anything about their B12. I, I don't know specifically about their B12. Um, I haven't looked to see if Trader Joe's has been certified or not. I, I do think they're a pretty reputable store. Yeah, I do think they're a pretty reputable store, but I haven't like personally checked that. Um, but but you guys could look online, or somebody at Trader Joe's could probably tell you. But I do think Trader Joe's is pretty reputable. Thank you. There's just like I said, there's you know hundreds, hundreds of thousands of supplements on the market. It's impossible to know every one, even if that was your full time job. So. Okay, I think we're going to uh, disconnect from our remote users, and um, thank you guys for listening. So, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Thank, thank you. you.